Okay, we're doing well. Uh, almost there. Same speech every year. Yeah, awesome. I can just bring out the same one. Exactly. Okay, let's uh, let's all sit, please. I don't see anybody else coming in the back. Okay, excellent. See, journalists are always on time. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nick Lemon, the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism, and I want to extend a warm and wet welcome to the members of the class of 2011 and their families. Every year at our graduation ceremony, they let me make a few remarks before we get to the heart of the event as long as I promise to keep them brief. So that's uh, where we are now. Um, I'm somewhat notorious around here for not having gone to journalism school. When this uh, fact is flung in my face, I usually sheepishly argue that I was lucky enough to have had extraordinary mentors in my first few newsrooms who collectively comprised an informal school of journalism. That's true as far as it goes, but it isn't the real story. During the past two academic years, I've taught three different courses here, history of journalism, evidence and inference, and the art of the interview. In all three cases, I will now confess, I was not passing on the wisdom and knowledge that I've accumulated over the course of decades of working as a journalist. I was instead, learning the material myself for the first time so that I could teach it to my students. To make the point more broadly, I sometimes think that my becoming dean here was a secret plot on my part to get myself the journalism education that I never had. And what I've taught myself in my eight years here in order to teach it to my students has made me a better working journalist during the limited time that I have to be one. As a journalist in even a great news organization, you're living life in two dimensions. You have access only to what are the best practices in your own institution and its peers, and it is almost irresistibly tempting to assume that those practices are journalism. But as a student here, you are not trapped inside one moment in time, one country, or one corner of the news business. You can see what we do in three dimensions instead of two. An immediate effect of that is to make you see that journalism is incredibly various. It includes everything from statistical surveys to horoscopes and comic strips, from political activism to high objectivity, from investigation to intellection, from nonfiction books to tweets. And right now, journalism is getting more various, not less. Seeing how many different forms journalism takes poses a definitional challenge to us as journalists and educators. In my youth, it was at least possible to argue that journalism is whatever appears in a metropolitan daily newspaper or whatever appears in another medium that is linearly descended from what appears in a newspaper or to argue that a pyramid-style news story is the basic unit of journalism. It's not possible to be that specific anymore. We now have to define journalism as a function, not as a particular mode of presentation. 
Journalists are people who actively seek out the truth of a situation with all due humility about the difficulty of that project, but with real confidence and aggressiveness. We usually have to do this quickly, and therefore we have to make difficult judgments on the basis of incomplete or conflicting information. We present the material we found in a clear, accurate, engaging form that a general audience will find compelling and persuasive. But let me remind you, I'm resorting to this functional definition in response to the great proliferation of forms of journalism. Not because, as people often say these days, the familiar forms of journalism are converging into one. Now I know that on a news website, one can post text of any length, still photography, sound, and video, but there are not yet very many news organizations that sustain themselves by doing all those things at once equally well. We still have a newspaper business and a magazine business and a radio business and a television business, all looking less doomed than they might have a couple of years ago. Even within the world of online journalism, we're seeing more differentiation, not more convergence. Websites that are excellent at video are rarely just as excellent at text, and vice versa. Tablet journalism, just emerging, seems to be different from website journalism. Higher production values, less interactive. Mobile device journalism is developing its own distinctive norms, too. Another way of thinking about this idea of convergence and the future of journalism is in terms of the daily routine of a typical young journalist, somebody like you. One version has it that instead of living at the leisurely, quasi-academic pace of, say, Hildy Johnson in the front page, producing a daily story in text only for a morning edition, you'll all be frenetically filing, shooting, posting, tweeting, and updating continuously through every 24-hour news cycle. Each individual journalist will produce more material for more platforms at a relatively low level of sophistication because there's no time for a high level of sophistication. Given the experience that many of you have had every day at this school and at work before you arrived here and that you will have immediately upon leaving, I can't very well look you in the eye and tell you that this kind of journalistic life doesn't exist. But I would like to lay out an alternative vision of the future of journalism in the digital age. I will call it leveraged journalism. Let me return for a moment to my own late in life journalism education. Columbia is a research university. That means our faculty does research as well as teaching, and these two fundamental activities reinforce each other. For most of our faculty, research means producing works of journalism at a high level. For me, one of the great pleasures of being dean here is being able to spend my days with colleagues who are so engaged. But lately, we have been taking on a second research mission, research about journalism. Our profession is changing so rapidly that we just don't have a full, reliable picture of what's going on. And this school has the good fortune to be one of the few journalistic institutions in the world with the capability to help create that missing picture. As we'd say in our business, this is a monster story and it's on us to cover it. Lots of people in the journalism building, faculty members, students, staff members at Columbia Journalism Review take their own cuts at this topic. The aggregate of their individual work represents a major contribution by the school. And the school itself has begun commissioning research. We've published two major and widely discussed reports in the last year and a half. The first, published in October 2009, was The Reconstruction of American Journalism by Leonard Downey, Michael Shudson, and Christopher Anderson. It focused on the public and nonprofit sectors and on media policy. Among its many good effects was helping lead to a major report on the same subject by the Federal Communications Commission, which will be made public soon. Our second report, published just last week, was The Story So Far by Bill Gruskin, our academic dean, Ava Sieve, and Lucas Graves. 
It focuses on the market economics of digital journalism, and it is getting attention every bit as wide and favorable as our previous report. I hope we will publish a third report of similar ambition and impact, but on a different topic, about a year and a half from now. My hidden agenda in commissioning these reports is to use them to educate myself as dean about where our profession is headed and so to find out how the journalism school can be most useful, useful both as a teaching institution and as a public voice. In response to the Reconstruction of American Journalism report, I devoted this talk last year to urging our graduates to learn about and engage in the ongoing debate on media policy something that journalists of my generation were taught not to do because somehow it would sully our purity. Reading the Story So Far report is what led me to begin thinking about what I just called leveraged journalism. The report makes it clear that digital journalism is profoundly different from what digital folks like to call legacy journalism. Among the differences is that digital news organizations, as of now, have much smaller staffs than legacy organizations, but much bigger audiences and much more powerful tools with which to produce journalism. So the most useful way to think about the life of a digital journalist, I hope, is not as somebody who carries a backbreaking load of individual production responsibility. Instead, it's as somebody who figures out creative ways to use her own extraordinary capabilities, including digital skills, analytic ability, storytelling flair, and subject matter expertise, to blend a small but crucial measure of the work of her own two hands with a much larger measure of the work of others. This work can include aggregation and curation of news produced by other organizations, imaginatively locating and presenting material that is already in the public record, and using members of the audience as contributors of content. I don't know exactly how this is going to work, but it's something that we as a school and you as journalists must explore aggressively. We will be planning new curriculum and continuing to research what's going on in digital journalism. You should be thinking about how to use the skills you have to the highest possible advantage by making them the defining aspect of work that does not have to be produced entirely by you. Finally, bear in mind that you're not really leaving the journalism school this afternoon. Your status will change in about an hour from students to alumni, but that is still an active status. We will be following your achievements with love and pride, and we will be relying on you by your example and by your actively letting us know uh, to keep us informed about where this incredibly fast-changing profession is going. We are all on a great collective adventure, and we shouldn't let a little thing like graduation diminish the sense that we're all in it together. Thank you. Um, in line with my last point, uh, you either noticed or are unconsciously sitting on a J School tote bag, which represents a symbolic uh, uh, embodiment of your transition to being alums. So from now on, you must carry everything in your J School tote bag as you move throughout the world and cover big stories. Um, I now want to bring to the stage the aforementioned uh, Dean of Academic Affairs of the school, Bill Gruskin, who will introduce our student speaker. Bill? This is the last time you'll ever hear me say this. That is a fine looking class we got out here. <laughs> and I promise I won't say it to next year's class. <laughs> um, the Society of Professional Journalists is an international organization of reporters for broadcast, print, and digital media, and photojournalists who support each other and provide examples of best practices of journalism. They remind us to hold ourselves to the highest standards of ethics, integrity, and getting the story right as well as advocating the protection of First Amendment and its guarantees of freedom of speech and press through its advocacy efforts. 
at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. We have a student chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, or as we call it in our hashtags, SPJ, which also serves as the de facto student government. All of the officers are elected at the beginning of the fall term. This year, Zara Raja was elected the president. She was a dynamo of creativity, intellectual endeavor, and goodwill, both for the students and for those of us up on the seventh floor who like to know what's really going on on the six floors below us. When Zara was asked why she wanted to become president of the SPJ, she said, after a month of being surrounded by these amazing people, I knew I wanted to get a chance to work with them. I thought the best way to get to know them was by serving as president. Please join me in welcoming the 2011 class president, Zara Raja. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Gruskin. Thank you. Dean Lemon, faculty, administrators, guests, and the class of 2011, good afternoon and welcome to our graduation. We made it. I, I would, however, like to begin with some fact checking, if I may. When the MS students arrived at the J School in August, we were put through a digital media boot camp. Now, we were told the boot camp would end in three weeks. But ladies and gentlemen, a correction is in order. It lasted almost 42 weeks. The entire program is a boot camp and has only just come to a screeching halt. The class of 2011 that has just crossed the finishing line is an extraordinary one, made up of remarkable people. In the past 10 odd months, we have not only made huge leaps forward in our knowledge base and skill sets, we have also endured insufferable hardship caused, of course, by courses like RW1 and ENI. If you do not know what either of those acronyms mean, thank your stars, for you have been spared. <laughs> but in all seriousness, some of our fellow students uh, have faced some of life's most difficult challenges along with juggling their schoolwork. They have lost loved ones, undergone surgery, lost their funding, and yet they have stayed the course. For some of our international students, English is a second, third, or fourth language, Yet, they have managed to write at a level unimaginable to them even a couple of years ago. And one of our students actually went through her entire pregnancy this school year. And with the birth of baby, with the birth, and, and with the birth of her baby, our number has actually grown by one. And we, the class of 2011, have survived the coldest winter in New York history. I can safely say that this group of people are the most determined, hardworking, some of the smartest, yet the most friendly and fun bunch of people I have ever met. And that is why it's an honor to be part of this family. Now, like all families, we are somewhat dysfunctional, but in the end, we are indeed the few, the poor, the proud. So I applaud you, I applaud you all. Now, there's one thing that I'd really like to share with you today, and that's something that's been said to me repeatedly over the past school year. And that is, J School is all about choices. J School is all about choices. A number of people have told me that. And I'd like to dwell on this idea of choice just briefly. For example, we all picked different concentrations in our various programs this year. As some of us learned the hard way, choices are important. And while that might be true for anyone graduating, I would argue that it is of particular importance to young journalists and journalists in training today. Because above and beyond our abilities and capabilities to report and produce, what will really matter is what we decide to do with them. This is true in terms of building careers in an industry which is in great flux, yes. But more importantly, choice matters because in journalism, or journalism as at its, in its heart of hearts is a creative profession. At its heart, as you know very well, lies the art of storytelling. 
And so as artists, we make crucial decisions, not every day, not every hour, but every minute. We make them in the stories we choose to report, the people we speak to for those stories, the perspectives we include, and the ways in which we package and produce them. Creative work, it turns out, is done primarily through a process of elimination. Our stories are written not in the quotes and characters we include, but in those that we leave out. It is difficult to admit that absolute free choice, while an ideal, is but a myth. Our decisions are governed and limited by the world around us, but it is also our knowledge, or lack of it, that limits us. For example, we can only report that coveted, untold story if we know enough about it in the first place. And so one of the best ways to give ourselves the best chance possible at making the freest, the most independent, and the most ethical decision is by making it the most and best informed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I think is what we have gained in our time at the school. Knowledge with which to make these decisions. Education, yes, is a transformative experience. And an excellent education is, above all, an empowering experience. There are many people to thank for this. It's been an incredibly exciting year to be at the J School for all the new developments going on in the building, but also the big news stories breaking around us and that have visited us in the form of journalists covering those stories coming to the school. First and foremost, on behalf of the student government and our entire class, I'd like to thank our advisor, Rebecca Castillo, who could unfortunately not be with us here today, but without whose support... <laughs> but without whose support, guidance, and help, we really could not have functioned. Rebecca, I hope you're watching the live stream. Thank you for everything, and we wish you a quick and full recovery. The SPJ board members have been inspirational in their drive and energy to do things for their fellow classmates. Just in the past couple of months, they have put on events that classes have been rescheduled to accommodate. I cannot claim credit for these and the other initiatives, so may I request the SPJ Board of 2011 to please stand and be recognized for their phenomenal work. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our teachers and mentors for their time and dedication, all the school staff for their patience and, and hard work and diligence, and my fellow students for keeping each other going. I'd also like to commend my class for being the first standing class in the history of the J School to make a donation to the school that will go towards scholarship, scholarships for other students. So thank you. I applaud you for that. Finally, I'd like to thank my mother and my family, and by extension, everyone's families and friends, who have supported us throughout this year and indeed throughout our lives. Thank you mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, significant others, uncles, aunts, grandparents, friends, and pets. We would not have been here without you. So as we stand here at the threshold of life, beyond school, I guess. I can only hope that the education and the relationships that we have built here will give us both the knowledge and the courage to make not only the right choices, but also the daring ones. Professor Sig Gisler, at the start of the year, urged us to descend into the streets of New York with a sense of joyful entitlement, he said. That was the way to be a reporter. And we thank him for inspiring us with that. But if I could co-opt his phrase to say that I wish for my class, as we turn our attention to the powers that be in the fancy editorial offices and newsrooms, that we take with us a sense of joyful empowerment. Let us make our choices and find our voices and let our work and its quality be the expression of that. You have something to say and the world needs to hear it. Class of 2011, that, I hope, will make you not journalistic functionaries, but the visionaries that you are all more than capable of becoming. Choose well, be well, congratulations, and thank you.
Every spring, the faculty, the dignitaries assembled here, uh, of the journalism school votes to confer the Columbia Journalism Award. Uh, the mean people in low library over here will not let us give honorary degrees. Uh, only the university can give honorary degrees, but if we could, this would be our honorary degree. And in fact, it's better than an honorary degree because it's only one of them every year, um, as opposed to the several honorary degrees you just saw conferred this morning. Um, this year, uh, the faculty voted to confer the Columbia Journalism Award on Al Jazeera English. This is only the second time in the history of the award that it's been given to an institution. The last time was 1993, and the recipient was the uh, News Hour on PBS. Uh, uh, also, at, at that time, a significant new positive influence on journalism. Um, I should say, uh, just on a personal note, um, when I was uh, roughly your age, uh, and I was in the aforementioned non-journalism school, journalism school of life, in my first full-time job out of college, I worked for a uh, very broke uh, news organization called the Washington Monthly, a political magazine. Uh, before there was a crisis in journalism, we kind of invented the crisis in journalism, and that was our daily life, and it was never clear whether you'd be paid when payday came. And in the middle of all this bleakness, uh, one day uh, in the spring of, I guess, 1977 or 78, the word arrived that our editor and publisher and founder had been given the Columbia Journalism Award, Charles Peters. Um, and boy, did that feel good. So it's, it, it's not only meaningful on the giving end, but I hope it's meaningful on the receiving end as well. Uh, and it certainly was uh, the time that I was one step away from, from a recipient. Um, Al Jazeera English started in 2006. It's not yet five years old. Um, it's become clearly one of the most significant news organizations in the world, uh, not just in, in the English language. Um, it has an enormous audience uh, of, of at least 80 million people. Is that a good number? 250 million, sorry, it keeps growing. Um, <laughs> um, it has, it has uh, bureaus in many, many countries around the world. Uh, one of the few places uh, in the world where it's most difficult to watch is uh, the United States, where as of today, and I hope this will change, only uh, three middle-sized cities carry Al Jazeera English on their ordinary cable systems. Uh, however, um, when the Arab Spring began, uh, many of us on, on the stage, and I, I'm sure many of us in the room, uh, found that we could watch Al Jazeera English um, on the internet, on our computers, um, and that it was the best place to find out what was going on in this chain of momentous events. Um, so we all became addicts and really admiring addicts. Um, we were, the, by the, the functional standard I proposed earlier, who tells you on a truly enormous and complicated and widespread and difficult to get to story, who gives you the closest to the aggregate truth of the situation, aggressively and independently reported, it seemed to us that Al Jazeera uh, English won that title. Um, so it educates us in important ways. There's another way it educates us, and that is um, on the one hand, and this is one of the complicated things about journalism, um, and, and, and Zara just alluded to it herself. On the one hand, the facts of a situation are the facts of a situation, and we have a sacred duty to find them and report them accurately and clearly. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of art in the news, and, and everybody around the world does not have the same perspective. Everyone around the world does not have the same news judgment. Everyone around the world does not think the exact same things are important. Um, 
One of the most interesting evenings at this school since I've been dean was the evening we had Richard Sambrook, who was then one of the top uh, news officials at the BBC, come. And he did a show on a screen. It was at the height of the Iraq War. And he said, OK, the Iraq War is going on. It's a big story. Everybody's covering it. I'm just going to show you six different versions by six great news organizations around the world of what the story was on a particular day. No overlap. Six completely different stories. So uh, another one of the pleasures of watching Al Jazeera English on the internet, and, and I hope uh, one day soon on cable television, is it's an education not only on what's going on, particularly in the Middle East, but also in a different perspective on the news from what we have in America. There is not total non-overlap, but there is not total overlap either, and, and that's quite interesting. Uh, it's also the case that there is not a unified Middle Eastern perspective on the news, um, as seen by the fact that, that one of Al Jazeera's reporters, Dorothy Parvaz, just got sprung uh, from captivity. Uh, she was taken captive in Syria, where she went missing and moved to Iran and then held for a few days. And I don't know how what you do somehow just got out. So um, uh, you, you cannot get everybody everywhere to agree that the, your version of the news, even if it's absolutely accurate, is the only possible version of the news, and that's what makes our, our jobs interesting. I'm about to bring to the stage Al Anstey. He is the managing director of, um, of, of Al Jazeera English, a, a post he assumed in the fall of 2010 after a long and distinguished career in broadcast journalism in Australia, in Britain, in America as both a correspondent and an executive and as, as being one of the founding crew of Al Jazeera English. Your life may be filled with sorrows that I don't know about, but it sure seems from here like you were a lucky guy to take the helm just days before this fabulous story broke, and, and you've done a great job covering it, um, and, and we're proud to present you with the Columbia Journalism Award for 2011 and to ask you to speak to us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Here it is. Thank you. I certainly was lucky to take over just before the most amazing period in history. And to use a phrase that's not often used by a Brit, but I've just heard, boy, does this feel good. <laughs> this really is an honor to receive this award. As the Dean said, Al Jazeera English is a four-year-old child we launched four and a half years ago. We're made up of staff and journalists from all over the world, 30 plus nationalities in the newsroom alone, who came together in the pursuit of good journalism and clear storytelling. So we're especially proud to be recognized by the Columbia Journalism School, an institution respected worldwide for its integrity, for its journalism, and for the caliber of the journalists that leave here. It's a magnificent event today. I wasn't quite expecting this. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to accept the award and delighted to see the class of 2011 enter the world of journalism today. So a big thank you to Columbia, to the Dean and his colleagues. A thank you to all of my colleagues at Al Jazeera English. This is a testament to their commitment and dedication to journalism. This is an extraordinary time to be in the media and an extraordinary time to be entering into the media. The Arab world is seeing dramatic changes. The landscape of that region is changing day by day. But the wider world too is dominated by fast-moving, complicated stories. Just look back at this year. We started with the Sudan, the referendum, the Ivory Coast, a change of leadership. Japan, any other year, Japan would have been a lead story now, but it was in many respects dwarfed by the enormity of the events in Egypt, in Syria, in Libya, in Tunisia. The interception of Osama bin Laden, and of course, the royal wedding. <laughs> In a complicated, fast-moving, oftentimes dangerous world, 
people are craving reliable information. And without trustworthy information, divisions between peoples, divisions between cultures, are created by a lack of understanding. And those divisions are being perpetuated without trustworthy information. And with opinion journalism creeping into the mainstream, some of those information bridges risk being blown up. We're operating in an environment where trusted information is scarcer and scarcer and scarcer. Citizen journalism is filling a gap, and it's hot on the heels of traditional journalism, as I call it. The definition of journalist is being questioned more and more. The fundamental role of the media is being studied and challenged. Are we opinion formers, opinion makers, truth seekers, storytellers, rating seekers, or just damn good entertainers? What we do now, in my view, is, in, is as important as ever, arguably more important now than ever before. Our job is not to take sides, but to report all relevant sides of stories, all opinions, and then dig hard to try to get to the truth. Apply integrity to everything we do. We exist to cover stories, not to create them. The more complicated the story, the more it requires good journalism. And in times of conflict, as we're seeing now, spin often turns to propaganda. Diversions become bald lies. And don't forget, in the midst of all of this are real people, often caught in the middle, in the crossfire. I'd like to quote an example from recent days as it demonstrates one of the continuing daily challenges amid some of the events that are taking place in the Arab world. Just last week, two eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses came on our air to talk about what was going on in one particular town in Syria that day, a town called Dira. The first, a Syrian army spokesperson, who told us, quotes, the army entered Dira at the request of residents to rid the city of terrorist gangs who are responsible for a spate of killings and vandalism. Just a couple of hours later, another eyewitness. We witnessed a massacre in Dira. The army just went everywhere in the city and they attacked defenseless people. 6,000 men are being held. and They've been tortured by the army and the regime. Bear in mind, when we reported those two eyewitness statements, electricity, internet was cut off to the city. We were banned from being there. We were unable to have our own journalists on the ground to witness those events for ourselves, to claim and counterclaim within the space of two hours. And in the middle of it, real people's lives being overturned. Whatever the truth is there, it's worth digging for. Journalism is about people's right to know, and in so many parts of the world, it is truly a matter of life and death. It's ironic, then, that despite the need for journalism with integrity, despite the fact that the world is becoming smaller, flatter, and more accessible to its people, despite the fact that the events we are covering are seemingly ever more complicated and interlinked, we're living in an age but the challenges to journalism are ever increasing. The media industry itself is facing a huge commercial pressure right now. The world economy is in decline. We report it every day.
despite the world becoming smaller and more accessible, large parts of the world remain uncovered and unreported. Add to this the way that we're reporting news hasn't changed much for some time. The world is a vast, vast, complicated place. Stories erupt out of the blue. News is full of surprises. No day is the same. It's one of the reasons why we love it. Yet the formula of news hasn't changed with the evolving world. Look at the classic standard bulletin. Three headlines. Last one should be a teaser. Three packages. A light story at the end before you go into the break. A tease into the, well, it's the story after the break. Interesting story. A couple of domestic stories. Foreign underlay sequence. Light story, weather, wrap, goodbye. <laughs> that was a rapid bulletin. No package longer than two minutes. No soundbite longer than seven seconds. Well, the world's a dynamic place. Is that formula really representing the dynamism of the world? And as the ramifications of the economic challenges are rising, the power of spin is ever more pervasive. The world is full of sides, we know that. It's full of different opinions. Politicians, corporations, individuals, all have an interest in what we report and how we report it. They're well-versed at amplifying and dampening news lines to steer us on a course which is most advantageous to them. The machinery of spin operates everywhere, no matter where you go in the world. It's become an endemic part of democracy, and it's become part of dictatorship. No matter where we're broadcasting from and broadcasting to, the message is massaged. The truth is disguised. And all of this is happening in the context of one very important development new media, in many senses, now media, it's happening. The exponentially increasing conversation about world events and about domestic events that's going on online is dwarfing traditional media's prominence and privilege in the information world. Without reliable information, people are hunting out their own stories. They're finding their own facts. People are turning to one another rather than traditional institutions to find out what's going on. And technology is facilitating that dialogue and engagement the rise of social media means the world is now made up of millions of eyewitnesses to events. Bloggers are becoming the new information providers. Mobile phone camera people are becoming the eyewitness reporters. YouTube is the new television news. Twitter is putting information into the public domain, whether we like it or not. But be careful. That information, sometimes, is unverified, unfiltered, unmoderated. It can be an articulation of opinion, it can be an articulation of fact, or it can be articulation of prejudice and sometimes just bald lies. Contributors are anonymous and unaccountable. Information in the ether sphere, perhaps, devil's advocate argument, is telling you everything and nothing at exactly the same time. So what is the boundary? What is the journalist in the new age of new media? Well, despite some projections, and I'll cheer up now, uh, we're not seeing the death of journalism as we know it. We're seeing a marriage of old and new, of traditional journalism and new media. But this marriage, it has no vows, it has no promises, there's no prenuptial agreement if the marriage fails, there's no external court to bring together the two parties if needs be. Right now, there are no established rules. We're finding our feet in this new world, but we must make that marriage work. There's one other aspect of new media that I think has to be a key part of the discussion. New technologies are changing the way people are receiving information as well as interacting with it. Audiences want information at a time and place of their choosing, not our choosing, and they want to interact with it. In this April, this last month, over 66 million people got their information from Al Jazeera English online. Over 61 million minutes were watched live online in the same period of time and 36 million minutes of Al Jazeera English was watched on the iPhone alone in the first quarter of this year. Over half a million people get their news from us on Facebook. And for our sister channel, Al Jazeera Arabic, in excess of one million people get their information through Facebook. This isn't just TV everywhere. This is content everywhere and all of the time. We're going through a fundamental change in the way that people are digesting information. And the challenge, I think, for all of us is to ensure that no matter what the platform, the integrity of that information is always intact. So amid all this change, what is the mission? 
Well, for me, the core, as I call it, the journalism must be protected. The information must be credible. It must be trusted. It must be in depth. It must be done with integrity. Eyewitness report, first-hand journalism, original reporting, it's the lifeblood of what we do. Give the full story. If it needs explanation, if it needs time, if it needs history, if you need to add context, give it the time. Give the full picture to our audiences, listeners, and viewers out there. Hear the voices of the people. We talk about at Algeria, the voice of the voices. If you're covering an environmental summit, you've got world leaders in the si inside the summit, yes. And there's lots and lots of cameras filming those world leaders, making very important decisions in the corridors of power. But halfway around the world, the real people that are really impacted by those decisions that are being made. Let's hear the voices of those people. Don't see the world through a prism. We talk about lots of different perspectives. If you narrow the prism, you narrow what's going on out there in the world or in the country or in your region. Put the countries of the world on a level playing field. Look at the story, evaluate them on their merit. Cover all sides of the story, all relevant sides of the story. Be devil's advocate when you're challenging those stories and ask the challenging questions. And as we know, when we gather so many people from so many different backgrounds and cultures, challenge all of our own preconceptions when we're studying how to do the stories we do. Dig for the truth and never accept anyone else's assumed reality. Work in partnership with new media. Tap into those eyewitness reporters that are ever increasingly out there in the world. Verify, source that video and information, but encourage and inspire the contribution. Engage with the ethosphere. And sometimes I think the best thing that's happening to modern journalism. So engage with citizen journalists so that people can be part of the dialogue and the debate. So despite the challenges, there is great cause for optimism. And this is an amazing event. The future of journalism is in this room. There's no doubt in my mind that the commitment to, to journalism is very, very much alive. There is a determination to rise above the challenges, a resolve to dig deeper, and to continue the quest for truth, and a resolve to provide credible information that facilitates a greater understanding of what is happening in this world, why it's happening, and ultimately, what it will mean into the future. We held a forum at the museum in Washington, DC yesterday, and I spent a few minutes just walking around looking at the heyday, the golden era of journalism. Uh, some of these even I was not alive for. Robert Kappa's photographs of D-Day, for example. Seymour Hersh's account of My Lie, the New York Times' publication of the Pentagon Papers. Hugh Kongut's photograph of that girl in Vietnam, the victim of a napalm attack. Edward Murrow's ra radio reports from World War II. And of course, the Watergate reporting from Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein some of the greatest journalism in history and on earth. But that spirit of truth-telling, that spirit of holding power to account lives on. There are many of tens of thousands of dedicated individuals who are giving their all, and sometimes risking all, searching for the truth and in the pursuit of the democratic right for people to know what's going on in their world. I'd like to mention two of our journalists now, Dorothy Parvez and Kamel al -Tahlou. Dorothy was detained in Syria for a number of days and then moved to Iran, detained in Iran. And I'm delighted to say, out last night. <clears throat> Kamal detained in Libya. We haven't heard from him for a very long time. Both of these people, both of our journalists, were detained for doing a great job of being great journalists. And right now, we're calling for Mal to get out now from Libya. There are huge challenges facing media, journalism, and journalists worldwide. But whatever barricades are put in our way and your ways in the future, take on those challenges headlong. We've got to be resolute in calling for the freedom of journalists to do their job, for the freedom of speech, and for the right worldwide to know. And we must continue to strive to take our profession, this ever-changing, rapidly evolving profession, into the future with integrity, with credibility, and with truth. So we're living through extraordinary times at the moment, and I feel that's going to continue for many months, if not years, to come. This is an extraordinary time for Al Jazeera, and it is a true honor to receive this. So on behalf of everyone at Al Jazeera English, 
but also my colleagues at our sister channel, Al Jazeera Arabic, and all of our staff at Al Jazeera Network. This is a testament to them, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you too get a Columbia Journalism School tote bag. <laughs> <laughs> Just one other word about this. Um, you know, Nate Silver was quite eloquent on a number of fronts in speaking to us yesterday, and one point he made is uh, that uh, as a journalist, you have to attend to your own sort of brand identity and be prepared to move hither and yon, and he's right. On the other hand, institutions matter also, and the archipelago of really significant journalistic institutions that hold dear the values that Al Anstey just laid out in his talk is not infinite. Uh, I hope this school is one of them, and when there's a new one, it's a really important development for our profession. Um, and, and Al Jazeera English is a new one, and, and it's a wonderful thing uh, to have individual achievement, but it's also a wonderful thing to create a significant and, we hope, lasting new institution producing news. Um, now, for a sort of quasi-surprise, um, one of our graduating students this year, Katama Cahill Jackson, happens to be grandson of Pete Seeger, who needs no real introduction, uh, the famous and legendary folk singer. Um, he is here for the graduation, and he's agreed to uh, come up to the stage and entertain us for a few minutes. So please welcome Pete Seeger. If any of you have lived in Albany, you've heard the first verse of a song written by a working newspaper man who lived in California 60 years ago. And because at age 92 my memory was going, Right now, I'm trying to remember his memory, <laughs> remember his name. Maybe I'll remember it before, I, because I thought you should hear two more verses in his song. Newspapermen meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. Ting a ling a ling, city desk, hold the press, hold the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess, beats the test. Oh, newspapermen meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. Oh, you remember Mrs. Sadie Smuggery. She wanted money to buy her new fur coat. To get insurance, she employed skullduggery. She up and cut her husband's only throat. ting a ling a ling city desk, hold the press. Oh no, I left out a line. She chopped him into fragments. She stuffed it in a trunk. She shipped it all back yonder to her uncle in Bodunk. Oh, newspapermen meet such interesting people. 
It must have startled poor old Sadie's unk. Tingling, ling, sitting desk. Hold the press, hold the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess, beats a test. Newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Their policies an acrobatic thing. They claim to represent the common people. It's funny, Wall Street never has complained. Ah, but publishers have worries, for publishers must go to working folks for readers and to big shots for their dough. Publishers are such interesting people. It could be prostitution, I don't know. Ting-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, circulation. Ting-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, advertising. Get those readers, get that payoff. What a headache, what a press. Publishers are such interesting people. Let's give three cheers for freedom of the press. Must have been 40 years ago, I got a letter from one of my publishers saying, Pete, can't you write another song like Good Night Irene? I can't market these protest songs you keep singing. I was a little angry. I pulled a slip of paper out of my pocket, which I copied a, an extraordinary poem. I had been reading uh, the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. Uh, but I found out since then, his Hebrew name was Koheleth, meaning convoker, people who call pe people together. And I had just bought a little tape recorder, and I improvised a tune, mailed it off. A couple weeks later, I got a nice letter from the publisher saying, just what I was looking for. He got it to an extraordinary electric band, the birds, and they sent this song around the world. If anybody knows it, hope you sing with me. It sounds a lot better than my cracked old voice. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season. a time for every purpose under heaven. You can sing that, can you? To everything. And the word turn three times. I'll give you the words of the verses so you can sing them too. To be born, a to plant, to reap, a time to plant, a time to kill, to heal, a time to kill, a time to laugh, to weep, a time to laugh, a time to weep, to everything. Everything. 
and a time and a time for a purpose and a time to build up a time to break down a time to build up a time to dance to mourn a time to dance a time to cast away stones a time to cast away to gather a time to gather stones together hey get some harmony on that chorus now do everything summer can sing do everything, do everything, do everything, do of love, a time of hate, a time of love, a time of war, of peace, a time of war, a time, a time you may embrace, a time you may refrain, a time to refrain. Where's that harmony? Do everything. time to gain, a time to lose, a time to gain, a time to, to rend, to sow, a time to rend, a time of love, of hate, a time of love, a time of hate, a time of peace. I, I can't resist. And there's also a time to graduate. <laughs> and this is it. Um, at yesterday's journalism award ceremony, student prizes and honors were awarded. I would like to reprise the list of winners now. First, I'd like to call your attention to the students who are graduating with honors. I'm going to call out a list of names. Please stand as I read your name, and the rest of you, please withhold your applause until the end. Here we go. Uh, Vegas Alst, Jason Alcorn, 
Alexandra Alper, Elizabeth Anderson, Willow Belden, Edward Chun, Jonah Comstock, Elizabeth Davies, Jennifer DePriest, Lauren Dockett, Tamir Elterman, Amara Grotsky, Samuel Guzik, Joshua Haskell, Lisa Held, Mary Johnson, Jamie Joyce, Ashley Killo, Noya Kohavi, Ivana Katasava, Lynn La, Niharika Mundar uh, sorry, Mundarna, Anna Merlin, Joshua Moyer, Rodney Muhumuza, Richard Nieva, Catherine Olson, Nicholas Pandolfo, Cesare Podkul, Robin Respo, Albert Samaha, Yardena Schwartz, Kiara Sotie, uh, Itung Sun, Jason Tomasini, Caitlin Tremblay, Ben Walzer, Cherise Williams, and Stephen Witt. Now you may applaud. Now I'll reprise the winners of the awards that we presented yesterday so that parents and guests may share the honors with our graduates. Same drill, I'll call your name, please remain standing, and audience, please hold your applause until the end. The Richard T. Baker Bronx Inc. Award went to Ethan Froggett. The Richard T. Baker Brooklyn Inc. Award went to uh, Ivana Katsova. The Richard T. Baker Columbia News Service Award went to Amara Grotsky. The Richard T. Baker Award for Literary Journalism went to Vegas Oss. The Richard T. Baker Magazine Production Award went to Pauline Eiferman. The Richard T. Baker Magazine Production Award to Leah Cooper. The Richard T. Baker Magazine Writing Award went to Atusa Abrahamian. The Richard T. Baker Magazine Writing Award went to Anna Merlin. The Nona Balakian Award for Literary Criticism to Delaney Hall. Best MA Thesis Award to Naomi Zevilov. The runners up for that award, Delaney Hall and Rachel Iranga. The Richard Blood Scholarship, Lauren Dockett and Elisa Vine. The DuPont Judy F. Crichton Documentary Award to Mar Cabra and Sarah Fitzpatrick. The Philip Greer Award to Elizabeth Davies from the MS program and Duncan Wilson from the MA program. The Robert Harron Award to Ar Antoine Gara. The Fred M. Heckinger Journalism Education Award to Monica Vusong and Jason Tomasini. The Horgan Prizes for Excellence in Critical Science Writing went First place, Nathan Hurst. Second place, Carla Klipstein. Third place, Elliot Ross. The Outstanding Journalism Editorial Writing Award went to Atosa Abrahamian. Peter Keller Editing Prize, Amanda Rents. Joan Connor Broadcast Journalism Award to Jennifer DePriest. The Law Prize to Willow Belden and Andrew DeSilver. The Linton Fellowship in Book Prizing to Jamie Joyce and Stephen Witt. The Melvin Mentor Award to Cesare Podkul. The Lars Eric Nelson Prize to Josh Moyer. The Photojournalism Award to Saskia de Rothschild. The Henry N. Taylor Award to Vegas Ass. The James A. Wexler Award for International Reporting to Muhammad Bilal Lakhani. <laughs> the James A. Wexler Award for Local Reporting to Robin Respo. The Louis Winnick Prize to Nick Pandolfo the Digital Media Interactive Design Prize to Jason Tomasini, Excellence in Digital Media Interactive Workshop Prize to Jason Alcorn, the Digital Media Multimedia Storytelling Prize to Dewey Cook and Chitra Chowdhury, Digital Media Visual Storytelling Prize to Lynn Tatt, Nightly News Workshop Prize to Pallavi Reddy and Ignacio Torres, the Radio Workshop Prize to Willow Belden, the Video Storytelling Workshop to Elizabeth Davies and Tamir Elterman. Okay, you can clap now.
Now I'm going to repeat the names of the recipients of the awards to the highest ranking students in the class, the Pulitzer Traveling Fellowships, part of Joseph Pulitzer's founding legacy to the school, uh, which go to five outstanding students to enable them to travel and study abroad. One Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship is presented to a student with a special interest in the arts and arts criticism. That one went to Jimmy So. Uh, next fellowship to Willow Belden. Next to Niharika Mundana. Next to Samuel Guzik. And the last one uh, to the top student in the class, Elizabeth Davies. I'm now going to turn the microphone over for the rest of this ceremony to our Dean of Student Affairs and uh, graduation day pronunciations are Sri Sri Navasan. Sri, come on up. Thank you. It's getting organized here, folks. Let's give Mr. Seeger a big hand. There he is, just taking his seat. When I arrived in this country as a nine-year-old, fresh off the boat, his songs were among the very first we learned at PS6. And today, I got to see him sitting in that seat with a banjo on his knee. Good afternoon, everyone. Big, big congrats to all our graduates. I told you it would go fast. Nine months for our MA students, 10, month, 10 months for our MS students, and several short years for our PhD students. As you know, I love inviting all of you to events, so here's another. Friday's orientation for our next group of part-time students. 4.30 p.m., Stabile Student Center reception, be there. It is my honor now to introduce you to graduates from 40 countries and 35 states. Some of the names you will hear today will not be familiar to you for three reasons. One, some students have chosen to use a more traditional form and pronunciation instead of the more Americanized versions you're used to. Two, some have chosen their full formal names in all their glory rather than the more nicknamey names you know them by. And the third reason, I'll simply get them wrong. <laughs> so let me apologize in advance to all the parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and distant relatives after whom these students have been named. I apologize and I'm sorry. Now, on with the show. I'd like to ask Assistant Dean of Students, Melanie Huff, to join me on the stage, and Dean <laughs> Nicholas Lemon. Before you meet the grads, I'd like to acknowledge 10 students who began their program with all these students, but were selected to stay for a special advanced documentary program under Professor June Cross. They will get their degrees in October. Please hold your applause till I have read all the names, and students, please stand as I recognize you. Ashley Semler, Diana Neal, Eric Paterno, Ina Sotirova, a member of the United States Armed Forces, for a veteran of the United States Armed Forces, Jonathan Hall, Martin Markovitz, Matthew Kelly, Patrick Martin Menard, Sana Gulzar, and Sandhya Dirks. You all have the blue program in front of you. You can take it out, but it will not help you keep track of how much time we have left because we are not reading them in that order. I'll be reading out names by the students' classes, the special classes they were in, their main courses, and they'll be getting their diplomas from their professors. So I will announce the name of each professor who is giving out the diploma, 
and then read the name, the hometown and the names of the students. All right, here we go. First presenter is Professor Elena Cabral. Yes, please applaud as they, I bring them up. She'll be presenting our October 2010 candidates and getting their Master of Science degrees. First up, from Denver, Colorado, Ryan Auer. From New York and Bogota, Colombia, Mariana Cristancho An. Our next presenter is Professor Robin Reisig. From Garden City, New York, Alexis Leondis. From New York, New York, Andrea Murad. Our next presenter is Professor Beth Whitehouse. From Flushing, New York, Richard Allen Chen. Sam, uh, Professor Sam Friedman is our next presenter, substituting for Professor Beth Whitehouse. Our next presenter, our, our next student from Lansing, Michigan, Ben Waltzer. And Kieran. Our next presenter is Professor Addie Rimmer. From Hopkinton, Massachusetts, William W. Newbrander. I'm going to ask Professor Isaac to come back. And our next student, our next graduate from Atlantic Beach, Florida, is Mary K. Johnson. Next, we have our PhD students, newly minted PhDs. Presenting will be Professor Andy Tucker. From Buenos Aires, Argentina, Dr. Pablo Calvi. From Vancouver, Canada, via Texas, Dr. Joe Cutberth. From Greenwich, Connecticut, Dr. Sophie Gittay. Next, we'll be presenting our Master of Arts students, and they are, took concentrations in arts, pol business, politics, and science. Our first two presenters in the arts program are Professors Elisa Solomon and David Haydu. From New York, New York, Shira Dicker. From Summit, New Jersey, Alexander George. From Albuquerque, New Mexico, Delaney Hall. From Bombay, India, Parizad Khan. From Changchun, China, Joy Dong Xiao Ma. From San Juan, Puerto Rico, Nuria Net. From Edmonton, Canada, Alyssa Noel. From Hong Kong, Jimmy So. From Atlanta, Georgia, Jennifer Camille Thomas. From Eufaula, Alabama, Tracy Tory Thompson, also receiving her Master of Science degree.
Our next presenters from the business concentration are Professors James Stewart and Sylvia Nasser. From Flushing, New York, Tanya Benedicto. From New York City, Antoine Guerra. From Brooklyn, New York, Linda Louise Lacina. From Lagos, Nigeria, Uchechi Okoronkwo. From Copenhagen, Denmark, Natalia Racklin. From Dublin, Ireland, Neve Sweeney. From Herfie, China, Wan Chu. From Wellington, New Zealand, Duncan Wilson. Our next presenters are from the politics concentration, and the presenters are Professor Alexander Stilla and Tom Edsel. From Coolamon in New South Wales, Australia, Alice Lynette Marika Brennan. That makes it easy. Just shout over the name, then I don't have to worry about getting it right. Let's see if we can do that with all of them. Let's be perfect. From McLean, Virginia, Catherine Myers Dunn. From Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Erica Fry. From Pretoria in South Africa, Leomi Creel. Do it one more time. Loemi Creel. From Diego Martin in Trinidad and Tobago, Golda Lee. From Brooklyn, New York, Thor Newrider. From Columbus, Ohio, Will Oremus. From Minsk in Belarus, Maria Sodoskaya. From Trondheim in Norway, Siv Sandvik. From Alhambra, California, Rachel Gabriela Uranga. From Ogden, Utah, Naomi Zevloff. Our next presenters are from the science concentration. Professors Marguerite Holloway and Professor Jonathan Wiener. From Baltimore, Maryland, Allison Becker. From Rochester, Minnesota, Kirk Clocky. From New York, New York, Vivian Marks. From Chennai, India, Divya Nair. From Larchmont, New York, Daniel Rosen. From New York, from Newark, Delaware, Rose Eileen Tabayan. From Virginia Beach, Virginia, Ashley Jean Winners Heron. Next, we'll be recognizing students from two separate mid-career fellowship programs. The first are the Knight Badgett Fellows, and they'll be receiving a Master of Science degree and a certificate in economics and business journalism. Presenting the diplomas are Professor Terry Thompson. And from New York, New York, Jill Barche. <laughs> New York, New York, Peter Beller. Sacramento, California, Christian Berthelsen. From Portland, Oregon, Andrew Carl De Silver. From Woodside, New York, Jennifer Haley. 
from Houston, Texas, Renee Merrill. From New York, New York, Alexander Osipovich. From New York, New York, Matthew Phillips. From Brookline, Massachusetts, Seth Stevenson. Next, we'll be recognizing one of our Spencer Fellows in Education Journalism and presenting the diploma is Professor Linnell Hancock. <laughs> Melicott City, Maryland, Greg Topo. <laughs> now we'll be recognizing our students with our Masters of Science in Journalism. First up are Professors Lenny Boren and Dodi Siantar. From Berkeley, California, Tamir Elterman. From Los Alamos, New Mexico, Ethan Copley Froggett. From Paris, France, Louis Imbert. From Plano, Texas, Ashley Killo. From Seoul, Korea, Hyrung Rose Kim. From Bangalore, India, Raksha Kumar. From Paris, France, Solange Moujon. From Island Park, New York, Dennis Murphy. From Toronto, Canada, Roshni Murthy. From Buffalo, New York, Caitlin Palumbo. From Mataro, Catalonia, Gisela Parrot Mori. From Athens, Georgia, Pallavi Reddy. From Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Alexa West. From Seoul, Korea, Audrey Yu. Our next presenters are Professors Elena Cabral and Rhoda Lipton. From Houston, Texas, Jacob Anderson. From New York, New York, Willow Belden. From Sumter, South Carolina, Melanie Monique Brisbane. From Bombay, India, Chitrangada Chowdhury. From Seattle, Washington, Sela for Kiwomona. From Saline, Michigan, Taryn Ann Hartman. From Queens, New York, Aliza Morgi. From Cluster, New Jersey, Michelle O. From Boston, Massachusetts, Melissa Ann Pirelli. From Toronto, Canada, Kumuda Ramanathan. From Dallas, Texas, Angel Lenise Robinson. From Hayward, California, Ignacio Torres. From Bremen, Germany, Monica Wusug. Our next presenters are Professors Ann Cooper and Betsy West. From Beirut, Lebanon, Linda Abi Asi. From Kwe Kwe, Zimbabwe, Kim Shingai Chekanitsa. From London, England, Sarah Elizabeth Fitzpatrick. 
from Los Angeles, California. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Hey, Who do I miss? Katrina is next. From Los Angeles, California, Katrina Kaufman. From Karachi, Pakistan, Mohammed Bilal Lakani. From Tampa, Florida, a veteran. From Tampa, Florida, a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, Alexander Luckinser. From San Francisco, California, Carlos Mayorga. From England and Pakistan, Zara Akbar Raja. From Londonderry, New Hampshire, Robin Michelle Respo. From Bogota, Colombia, Ingrid Rojas. From East Hartford, Connecticut, Juliana Schatz. From Sonoma, California, Kiara Sotile. You gotta give the broadcast faculty extra hugging time. From Burbank, California, Brett Teal. From Mexico City, Carla Zabludowski. Our next presenters are Professors Laura Muha and June Cross. From Torrance, California, Zorin Adamji. From From Petaluma, California, Meros Beg. From Singapore and Tokyo, Cheng Hung Shin. From Malibu, California, Olivia Rochelle Damawandi. From Dayton, Ohio, Joseph A. Danielwitz. From Glasgow, United Kingdom, Elizabeth Davies. From Paris, France, Saskia de Rothschild. From Los Angeles, California, Joshua Bernstein Haskell. From Delhi, India, Diksha Madhok. From Nigeria, Chienye Ogwo. From Oradell, New Jersey, Andrea Park. From Garden Grove, California, Jacqueline Quinn. From Perth, Australia, Harriet Riley. From Allentown, Pennsylvania, Umar Mohammed. From San Francisco, California, Mimi Wells. From Toronto, Canada, Semhar Walda Yeses. Our next presenter is Professor Anthony De Palma. From Clinton, New Jersey, Laura Christine Headley. From Warwick, New York, Lisa Elaine Held. From Stockholm, Sweden, Celia Cohn. From Athens, Greece, Joanna Katerina Nikas. From Forest Hills, Queens, Catherine Burns Olson. From Franklin Park, Illinois, Cesare Podkol. 
from Rockville, Maryland, Alice Popovich. Our next presenter is Professor John Dingus. From Bethesda, Maryland, Alex Alper. From Clearwater, Florida, Amaris Castillo. From Phoenix, Arizona, Michael Raymond Diel Castillo. From Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Caitlin Kucinich. From Beirut, Lebanon, Leah Kayata. From Mumbai, India, Sanya Ketani. From Caracas, Venezuela, Alejandro Lopez Diaro. From Yorktown, New York, Beth Alice Morrissey. From Beilfeld, Deutschland, Miranda Neubauer. From Hayward, California, Richard Joseph Nieva. From Fullerton, California, Brian Park. From Caracas, Venezuela, Manuel Rueda. From Schenectady, New York, Alicia Santo. From Linden, New Jersey, Camilo Hannibal Smith. From San Diego, California, Latoya Maria Tools. From New York, New York, Stephen Witt. Our next presenter is Professor Sam Friedman. From Miami, Florida, Michelle Bialik. From New York, New York, Denise Duana Blostein. From Miami, Florida, Christina Merrill. From New York, New York, Andrea Riquier. From Haven, Kansas, Jessica Scott. From Brooklyn, New York, Nakia Denise Spradley. From Jay, Florida, Megan Youngblood. Our next presenter is Professor Ari Goldman. And joined by Dr. Joe Cutberth. He was teaching in the program when he was a student in the PhD program. From Brooklyn, New York, Joseph Alexiou. From Bronx, New York, Astrid Baez. From Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, Heather Marguerite Higgins. From Huntington, New York, Christian Roman. From Pelham, New York, Todd Stone. Our next presenter is Professor Linnell Hancock. Presenting with Professor, Car uh, with, sorry, with Professor Barbara Kantrowitz. From Los Angeles, California, David Patrick Alexander. From Forest Hills, New York, Elizabeth Catherine Anderson. From Newton, Massachusetts, Stephanie Elizabeth Epstein. From Chicago, Illinois, Brent Ardo. From Florence in Italia, Elettra Fiumi. 
From Grafton, Massachusetts, Samara Grotsky. From Wellington, New Zealand, Nicola Keen. From Brooklyn, New York, Nick Pandolfo. From West Hartford, Connecticut, Catherine Pearson. From Buenos Aires, Argentina, Connie Pretti. From Dallas, Texas, Irisima Romero. From Greenfield, Massachusetts, Zachary Stan Stonebrun. From Parsippany, New Jersey, Ardena Schwartz. From Tianjin, China, Yiting Sun. From Half Moon, New York, Caitlin Tremblay. Our next presenters are Professors David Claytel and Howard French. From Washington, D.C., Mario Jose Aguilar. From Hofuf, Saudi Arabia, Ahmed Al Omran. From Arlington, Massachusetts, Alejandra Lilua Kalani Borunda. From New York, New York, Kitama Shabazz Cahill Jackson. From Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Francesca Crozier Fitzgerald. From Detroit, Michigan, Namira Olivia David. From Charlotte, North Carolina, Anna Elizabeth Edgerton. From Loudon, France, Alain Franchineau. From Singapore, Pei Shen Cho. From Baltimore, Maryland, Jewel Antoinette Johnson. <laughs> Broadcast faculty and others need lots of extra time. From London, England, Lucy Kinder. From Paramus, New Jersey, Amy Kuperinski. From Bonn in Deutschland, Benno Muschler. From Sacramento, California, Dexter Rashad Mullins. From Laguna Hills, California, James Plunkett. From San Jose, California, Lynn Tapp. From Nevada City, California, Bronwyn Tome. Our next presenter is Professor Dale Maharaj. From New York, New York, via Karachi, Pakistan, Kurtalen Ali Khan. From Paris, France, Pauline Eiferman. From San Rafael, California, Simone Gorindo. From Guangzhou, China, Huini Gu. From Santa Fe, New Mexico, Ryan May Handy. From Stevens Point, Wisconsin, Nathan Hurst. From London, in the United Kingdom, Nick Jardine. From London, England, Megan Eileen Kennelly. From Detroit, Michigan, Timothy Kaczynski. From San Francisco, California, Laura Renee Murray. From Torrington, Connecticut, Kate Poole. From Sacramento, California, Albert Concepcion Samaha. From San Francisco, California, Tatiana Yanira Sanchez. From Camp Zama, Japan, Arvin Temker. From Colombo, Sri Lanka, Raknesh Vijayawardene.
Our next presenters are Professors Mirta Ojito and Karen Stabiner. From Buenos Aires, Argentina, Andres Caballero. From San Francisco, California, Svetlana Dodirenko. From Copenhagen, Denmark, Lars Christian Widber. From Zezov, Poland, Anna Maria Jakubek. From Medford, Massachusetts, Daniel Carl Johnson. From Huntington, West Virginia, Lacey Ann Johnson. From Jerusalem, Israel, Noya Kohavi. From New York, New York, Lynette Paola Lopez. From Lima, Peru, Sandro Mayrata Luque. From Bangalore, India, Niharika Mandana. From Birmingham, England, Himanshu Oja. From Bridgetown, Barbados, Makita Kiria Monisa Peters. From Toronto, Canada, Julia Piper. From Lake Tahoe, California, Chloe Shieldhouse. From Jamestown, North Carolina, Caitlin Elizabeth Ugalik. From Berkeley, California, Ryan Villarreal. From Long Island, New York, April Jan Warren. Our next presenters are Professors Ruth Padover and Pamela Frederick. From Mission Viejo, California, Gray Beltran. From Hackettstown, New Jersey, Lauren Brown. From Cambridge, Massachusetts, Simon Doolittle. From Washington, D.C., Emilia Newell Ferrara. From Nogales, Arizona, Juan Gastelum. From Roslyn, New York, Sam Guzik. From Prague in the Czech Republic, Ivana Kotosova. From Jerusalem, Israel, Ruth Margalit. From Kampala, Uganda, Rodney Muhumuza. From Bogota, Colombia, Maria Potausi. From Santa Barbara, California, Benjamin Thomas Preston. From Sacramento, California, Richard Hamilton Proctor. From Leith, Scotland, Elliot Ross. From Huntington Beach, California, Aline Chekmajan. From New York, New York, Linda Thrasibul. From Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Eden Ezra Waldergei. Our next presenter is Professor Sandy Padway. From Geneva, Switzerland, Atusa Abrahamian. From Granville, Ohio, Leah Evan Binkowitz. 
From Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Leah Faye Cooper. From Homs, Syria, Hala Druby. From Durham, North Carolina, John Harrison. Urbana, Illinois, Umer Irfan. From Singapore, Shibani Matani. From Pembroke Pines, Pembroke Pines, Florida, Tony Ann Martin. From Caracas, Venezuela, Clara Martinez Turco. From Laramie, Wyoming, Nathaniel Massey. From Santa Fe, New Mexico, Anna Francesca Merlin. From Pottsville, Pennsylvania, Josh Moyer. From Woodmere, New York, Shlomo Sprung. From New York in the United States, accompanied by Lorenzo Zapata, two months old, Michelle Aresilis Tavares. From New York, New York, Erica Wolf. Our next presenters are Professors Robin Reisig and Michelle, Michelle Slatella. And Andrea Canapel. All right, three professors, so I better slow down. From Chandigarh, India, Pahul Benz. From Cumberland, Maryland, Catherine Balch. From New York, New York, Jared Samuels Baumeister. From Kingwood, Texas, Timothy D. Bella. From Miami, Florida, Ashley Calloway. From Indianapolis, Indiana, Jonah Clark Comstock. From Aston, Pennsylvania, Liz Day. From Middletown, New York, Ashley Dean. From New York, New York, Vladimir Dutier. From London in the United Kingdom, Ruby Edwards. From Indianapolis, Indiana, Benjamin Fierno. From New York, New York, Zachary Fryer Biggs. From Sao Paulo, Brazil, Luis Garcia. From Chennai, India, Lakshmi Kumaraswamy. From Portland, Oregon, Emily Marie Liedel. From London in the United Kingdom, Layla Molana Allen. From Fremont, California, Janine Celeste Pang. From New York, New York, Rama Reddy Raghavan. From New York, New York, Christina Suzanne Cuscati. From Newburyport, Massachusetts, Alyssa Vine. From Singapore, Sureka Agir Yadav. From Seattle, Washington, Leslie Yeh. Our next presenters are Professors Addie Rimmer and Dr. Joe Cutberth. From New York, New York, Jennifer DePriest. 
From Delhi, India, Suhail Khan. From Greenport, New York, Melissa Taylor Kondak. From Sneeds, Florida, Paige Rents. From Scarborough, Maine, Patricia Lynn Summers. From Los Angeles, California, Sharice Williams. Presenting for Professor Chip Scanlon is Dean Gu Bill Gruskin. From Bethesda, Maryland, Jeremy Brotman White. Our next presenter is Professor Michael Shapiro. From Bergen in Norway, Vegar Tenold Ose. From Nairobi, Kenya, Idil Abshir. From Bronx, New York, Yolene Almanzar. From Arad, Romania, Rebecca Roxana Brato. From Jacksonville, Florida, Joseph Doe. From Nyack, New York, Alexander Erickson. From New York, New York, Alex Nicholas Geeken. From Karachi, Pakistan, Maria Karimji. From Los Angeles, California, Michael Henry Keller. From San Jose, California, Lynn Lu Law. From Lynn, Massachusetts, Evan Matthew McDonald. From Baltimore, Maryland, Joy Marie Murphy McKenzie. Limore, California, Joe Proudman. From Brooklyn, New York, Lillian Rizzo. From Detroit, Michigan, Cambre Noel Thomas. From Istanbul, Turkey, Jaylan Yeganitsu. Our next presenter is Professor Paula Spann. From Bedford, New York, Jason S. Alcorn. From Batavia, New York, Sulome Anderson. From Johannesburg in South Africa, Zahir Kassem.